where the bourgeoisie rules. There are elements of metaphysics, agnosticism, indeterminism and outright clericalism abounding in the most exact sciences of nature, like modern biology, atomic physics, and stellar astronomy. The notorious Weissman is genes, isolated from any environmental impact, hang around them as some ghostly, nadotokimok, endowed with freedom of wool atoms, not finding a definite haven in space, randomly rush, finding themselves in several places at once, even smaller particles of matter, bumping into each other in general turmoil, now and then, destroyed. A whole starry worlds for some reason, run up anywhere. And this is called the science of nature. But, on the other hand, not all social sciences throughout the bourgeoisie's rule are complete anti-scientific apologetics. It is well known that in order to build scientific socialism, Marxism used not only French utopian socialism, but also British bourgeois political economy and German idealistic philosophy to use critical assimilation. One should not forget that in an antagonistic society, not all science is in captivity with class bosses and is far from being corrupt and deceitful. The struggle for the freedom of scientific thinking runs like a red thread through the whole history of culture. And in the old days there were many such fearless fighters for scientific truth, who were ready to lay down their head for its triumph in the fight against pharisaical shamanism. They can now be found even in the countries of the most aggressive imperialism. When dishonorable priests of science become dealers of death, making with the help of science the tools of mass killing, people of high culture cannot but protest against such monstrously criminal use of science. And it is not by chance that they increasingly raise their voice of protest at all international conferences and congresses of the world. At the same time, the fundamental difference separating genuine science, which is called upon to serve the people and all mankind at all stages of its development, becomes clearer and clearer from those of its class perversions that arise only temporarily over each antagonistic basis as a special protective superstructure created against the interests of the people and already therefore subject to liquidation after the underlying basis collapses. To be able to cut off all reactionary in science is the most important task of Marxists in their struggle against the ideological superstructures of the bourgeoisie. In any scientific field, it is necessary to strictly distinguish genuine science from pseudoscience, from those bourgeois superstructural distortions that we would like to call shamanism in science. If the apologetic pseudoscience as a protective superstructure serves as an ideological weapon of the struggle of the obsolete classes against the advanced classes, then genuine science, acting against pseudoscience, becomes a militant ideological weapon of the advanced forces of society against the entire reactionary ideology of decaying formations. Science in Production the multifaceted system of sciences studies specifically in its subdivisions the most diverse objects by special methods for solving various theoretical and applied problems. The common problem for the whole system of sciences is the problem of cognition of the objective laws of the universe, and in the field of practice, the use of these laws in the ideological struggle against the spiritual reaction for the best ideals of social truth both in the cultural construction of peoples and in the material production of the whole society. It is customary to think that production is associated only with the so-called applied sciences, and pure sciences hovering somewhere in the clouds of abstractions, in complete isolation from all earthly things, so it is obviously attributed to this notorious purity. However, this is a profound error. The theory in isolation from practice like a flower, torn from the soil, withers and withers. But socialist science is not threatened by such a fate. Despite the increasing specialization, our sciences are increasingly cooperating, mutually enriching themselves in the common service of the socialist economy. Organizationally this cooperation has already found its reflection in the system of institutions of the Academy of Sciences of the USSR, Recall that in the pre-revolutionary academy there were only humanitarian and natural historical branches and only in the Soviet period there grew a huge branch of the technical sciences.
and if only recently, applied sciences have been treated by some of the theoreticians as a second-class science, now their role in the cooperation of labor, where technology is the most important drive from scientific theory to economic practice, is becoming more and more obvious. As is known, the plan of scientific research work of the Academy of Sciences of the USSR is made by scientists themselves, agreed with the current needs of individual departments and corrected in connection with the general requirements of the national economy in the State Planning Committee, this plan serves as the government approves the national economic tasks of the country. Thus, not only apply disciplines, but the whole of science as a whole is put at the service of the economy. There are no solid boundaries between theoretical and applied sciences. Any science can in one case or another directly engage in production, receiving economic use. Today, not only geology, but also biochemistry and geophysics serve the tasks of mineral exploration. Microbiology with azotobacter cultures fertilizes the soil. Chemistry created the entire chemical industry. Physics has opened up broad prospects for ensuring production of all kinds of energy, up to and including intra-atomic. And now even such a section of it as electronics is included directly in production as a regulator of the automation of the entire industry of the coming communism. It is important to note that now not only representatives of individual sciences geologists, soil scientists are recruited to serve the socialist economy, but collectives of scientists of various specialties for the purpose of comprehensive coverage of all aspects of the object under study. The Academy of Sciences of the USSR possesses ample opportunities for almost any combination of sciences in the composition of such collectives. Considering this or that section of science in isolation from others, it is not always possible to predict the possibilities of its production applications. From the first experiments of splitting an atom to mastering intraatomic energy, not a close path. From a vicious circle in the system of sciences one cannot pull out a single length without harming the whole system as a whole and we will be able to fully appreciate the role of science in production only when we mobilize the entire system of sciences systematically and comprehensively on production tasks and move it forward not by small partisan attachments, but by a united front of all parts and types of scientific weapons. In the subdivisions of this front, social science is usually distinguished from the natural sciences. However, with such a systematics, from the cycle of sciences, for example, all philosophical and mathematical sciences, covering both society and nature, would fall out. But science of nature is too diverse to accommodate them in one heading, neglecting even such qualitative differences that are determined by the boundary between living and dead nature, and taking into account other jumps from the simplest to the most complex, the system of sciences in the most concise scheme seems to us in the following sections. The subject of study in this circle of sciences essentially changes, from abstract concepts and elementary elements, like magnitude, motion, atoms and molecules, to the most complex bodies, organisms and communities. But societies are made up of individuals, organisms and bodies are made up of molecules and atoms. Motion is inseparable from matter, and without the concept of magnitudes and the logic of judgments and inferences, none of the sciences will ever be born. This affirms their inner chain connection. And to clarify their relationship to production, we will give a more detailed breakdown of the general cycle of sciences in their most important divisions. Here is the shortest list. I. Mathematical Sciences 1. Arithmetic. 2. Algebra. 3. Geometry. 4. Trigonometry. 5. Analytical geometry. 6. Probability theory. 7. Differential calculus. 8. The integral calculus. 9. The calculus of variations. 10. Vector calculus. 11. Tensor calculus. 12. The theory of sets and so on. Mathematics is the most abstract of the sciences. 
its formulas in their letter expressions embrace any values, and arbitrarily large, and infinitesimal, and constants, and variables, both real and imaginary. Having a significant choice of ideas about space, mathematics will quite consistently expound to you both the geometry of Euclid, and the geometry of Lobachevsky, and the geometry of Riemann. In the first case, you will have to admit that the sum of the angles of a triangle is always 2d, in the second, that it is always less than 2d, in the third, that it is always greater than 2d. And whichever of these spaces is the subject of study, this will not change the formal conclusions of mathematics. This formalism conceals a certain danger of falling into idealism, as Vilenin wrote about it, having in mind physical and mathematical currents, but does not at all diminish the enormous role of mathematics in all technical applications of science in production. And not only the highest, but also the most elementary. After all, without arithmetic at the plant and geometry in the field, not only the engineer and the agronomist, but also the ordinary production worker, cannot do anything now. 2. Mechanical Sciences They have a practical application as 1. Theory of Elasticity 2. Resistance of Materials 3. Hydromechanics 4. Hydraulics 5. Aerodynamics 6. Construction Mechanics 7. Mechanical Technology 8. Machine Science, etc. The connection between this division of science and its neighbors, mathematics and physics, is close and inextricable. This whole branch of science is directly related to production. This connection is obvious. 3. Physical and Chemical Sciences Physics has practical application as 1. Power 2. Heat Engineering 3. Lighting Engineering 4. Telemechanics 5. Electrical Engineering 6. Radio Engineering, etc. Chemistry with its subsections, in particular, with physical chemistry 1. Thermochemistry 2. Photochemistry 3. Electrochemistry has a practical application as a chemical technology. Physics and chemistry unites the common object of study, matter. But the convergence of these sciences can be seen already from the appearance of such new disciplines as physical chemistry and chemical physics of obviously a hybrid origin. With mechanics, this branch of science is linked through physics, with astronomical sciences, through astrophysics and astrochemistry with geology, through geophysics and geochemistry. It is closely connected in many ways directly with production. IV. Astronomical Sciences 1. Confusion 2. Astronomy is theoretical 3. Astrometry 4. Celestial Mechanics 5. Astrophysics 6. Astrochemistry 7. Cosmography have a practical application as 8. Actinometry 9. Meteoritics 10. Navigation 11. Air navigation 12. Time service, etc. The bodies of heaven seem to be too far removed from us to directly serve our social production, and yet science forces them to serve it and in agriculture, where it is so important to take into account the receipt of solar energy, actinometry, and in navigation, and in air navigation, and wherever work is regulated by time. V. Geological and Geographical Sciences 1. Geophysics 2. Geochemistry 3. Geology 4. Mineralogy 5. Hydrogeology 6. Aerology 7. Geography Physical 8. Geodesy 9. Soil Science They have practical application as 10. Permafrost 11. Hydraulic Engineering 
12. Topography and others. The sciences of the earth reveal to us all its riches, in the depths, untold reserves of minerals, on the surface, all the resources of soil fertility, its watering and irrigation, these sciences serve weather forecasts and agriculture and air transport. By Biological Sciences 1. Biology 2. Biochemistry 3. Paleontology 4. Microbiology 5. Botany 6. Zoology Have a practical application as 7. Agronomy 8. Agrochemistry 9. Agrotechnics 10. Forestry 11. Zootechnics 12. Veterinary and so on the science of living nature is the most direct way in every state and collective farm and in agriculture and animal husbandry, radically increasing their productivity. Life science also serves industry, illuminating the processes of fermentation and winnemucking and distilling, microbiology, improving the baking of bread by the possibility of using enzymes and enzymes, biology, etc and even such a science seemingly far from production as paleontology, studying the life of long extinct organisms, helps geological searches for minerals. 7. Anthropological Sciences 1. Anthropology 2. Embryology 3. Anatomy 4. Physiology 5. Psychology they have practical application in connection with medicine, in particular, its sections. 6. Pathology. 7. Therapy. 8. Surgery. 9. Psychiatry. 10. Gynecology. 11. Pharmacology. 12. Hygiene and sanitation, etc. Reducing morbidity and mortality of people, human sciences at the same time significantly increase the effectiveness of this most important of the productive forces. The widespread introduction of this section of science for the Soviet period in our country was undoubtedly one of the sources of such an illustrative fact as the reduction in mortality in the USSR at least by half and the increase in the average life expectancy of our fellow citizens for at least 12 years. However, for this we had to multiply the medical staff once every ten. But still, considering that every doctor has to annually 15 saved lives, and for the whole practice, at least 20 years, up to 300, it will not be enough to say that his professional work pays off a hundredfold. 8. Socio-Historical Sciences A. Historical and Humanitarian 1. Ethnography and Ethnogenesis 2. Archaeology and the History of Material Culture 3. History of Countries and Peoples 4. Jurisprudence and History of Law 5. Linguistics 6. Literary Criticism 7. Art History 8. Military Sciences B. Socioeconomic 1. Politic Economy. 2. History of Economic Doctrines. 3. History of the National Economy. 4. Economogeography. 5. National Economic Planning. 6. Economics of Labor Industries. 7. The Science of Finance. 8. Statistics. 9. Accounting. The sciences on the basis and superstructures of society are more numerous than others and far from being exhausted by the above list. All of them are very far from the technology of production, but the more their educational role and organizing influence on producers, some of them still discipline and develop the idea of future producers in school, being hostile to all inertia and routine. Others, for example, the doctrine of the state and law serve under the socialism of organization and protection of social labor. Thirdly, the science of planning and finance, 
statistics and accounting, serve the distribution and accounting of labor resources throughout the country and the economic calculation in each production cell. A special place in the system of sciences belongs to such philosophical disciplines as 1. The history of philosophy 2. Dialectical materialism 3. Historical materialism and 4. Logic they can be placed at the head of the entire system of sciences and in their final link, which generalizes and crowns the entire system. They connect in their highest unity not only the entire system of sciences, but also all of them in conjunction with that economic foundation, towering over which science develops the more successfully than the more consistently serves it with all its levers. The wide introduction of the skills of dialectical thinking in our country serves as an inexhaustible source of new creative achievements not only in scientific theory, but also in the production practice of Stakhanov's work. So, even the most cursory review of the organization, objects of study and the current tasks of the system of sciences in the USSR convinces us that, not as separate sections, but as a whole, socialist science is one of the most important factors of social production in our country. Science and the Productive Forces The assertion that science is an important factor in production is now undeniable. The short course says, The tools of production, through which material goods are produced, People who drive the instruments of production and produce material goods thanks to a certain production experience and skills to work. All these elements together constitute the productive forces of society. The history of the CPSU, B. Short Course, pages 114-115. Let's try to decipher the contents of two basic elements, tools of labor, and people, from which the concept of productive forces is formed. What is, tools? This is primarily machinery, machinery and tools. However, nature does not build cars, locomotives, railways, says Marx. All this is the organs of the human brain created by the human hand, the materialized power of knowledge. And even the very process of production, Marx calls, experimental science, material creative and subject incarnating science. With the development of a large industry, along with machines, more powerful agents, such as steam and electricity, participate in the machine, the productivity of which, according to Marx, depends on the general state of science and the degree of technology development or application of this science to production. That is why, following Marx, one can say that the degree of development of tools of labor at the same time is an indicator of the extent to which social knowledge in general, science, has become a direct productive force from the unpublished manuscripts of K. Marx. Journal, Bolshevik, No. 11-12 for 1939, pages 61, 63 and 65. And now let us recall what determines the productive power of labor. The productive power of labor, Marx wrote, is determined by complex circumstances, among other things, the average degree of art of the worker, the level of development of science and the degree of its technological application, the social combination of the production process, the size and efficiency of the means of production, and finally, by natural conditions such. TX7, P46. It is very indicative that in this list of factors that determine the productive power of labor, not only the means of production, including, of course, the tools of labor, but also the level of science are named, and this potency of production is set even ahead of the material production funds with the inclusion of tools. The circumstances given here do not exhaust, however, all the factors that determine the productive power of human labor. In another place, among the factors and conditions from which the productive power of labor must depend chiefly, Marx calls both the fertility of the earth, and the acquired skills, and the division of labor, and the enlargement of production, and the concentration of capital, and machines, and all other inventions, through which science forces the forces of nature to serve labor, see works of TXIII. Part 1, P122. 
Thus, starting from the tools and people with their experience and skills, we must recognize that among the elements that determine the productive power of labor, and not primarily, but mainly, we have to call the general state of science, or the level of development of science, and all its applications, through which it forces the forces of nature to serve labor. It is very important to note here that science not only promotes the growth of the productive forces, but also under certain conditions becomes a direct productive force. One can even say under what conditions this transformation takes place. In the process of production of scientific products it is necessary to distinguish the following three stages of its readiness. At the first, rudimentary stage, scientific ideas that have not gone beyond purely ideological forms of consciousness can serve only as weapons of ideological struggle between competing worldviews and classes. At the second, preparatory stage, these ideas are already subjectively mediated, in teaching aids, schemes and models, in the laboratory and semi-plant verification of them, and they already become recognized as the potential for production. And only at the third, final, stage of their implementation, introduced into production, that is, materialized already in the instruments of labor and experience of producers, they receive a final confirmation of their truth and from potential strength they become the active productive force of society. We may be objected that the science used to build new machines is no longer a science, but an instrument of labor. But the metal from which these machines are built, does not cease to be metal and as part of tools. Similarly, scientific ideas, without which you do not construct a car, do not cease to exist, being realized on various tools of labor. If science ceased to exist from the moment it was introduced into production, it would not fulfill its basic purpose. However, analyzing the elements that make up the tools of labor, we can easily find out the material term, the living labor of the workers, and the scientific ideas embedded in their design. But if the materials and labor embodied in the car only reproduce themselves in the value of the products of this machine, the creative ideas of science embodied in it create an additional effect. They increase the amount of product per unit of labor, permitting the use of the gifted forces of nature. It would be even less permissible to forget about the participation in the social production of those elements of science that are summed up in the form of skills of thinking and professional art no longer in the instruments of labor, but directly in the heads of the producers themselves. Let us recall, for example, the following statement by Marx, the degree of art of the available population is always the prerequisite of all production, hence the main accumulation of wealth. The most important preserved result of previous labor, existing however in the most lively work, the theory of surplus value. T3, P229, 1936. The treasures of science, accumulated by the labor of generations of researchers of all times, become the common property of mankind. Every scientific discovery is worth their authors for many years of work with the full strain of creative forces. But the discovery of a genius can then easily be learned by dumb people. Those truths, on whose foundation the minds such as Euclid, Copernicus or Darwin have fought for the whole life, are now being mastered by millions of schoolchildren. But schoolchildren are future producers, and this ease with which the fruits of creative science, previously attained with the greatest difficulty, allows us to view science as a free gift in production. It can be realized in production only in conjunction with labor and in itself, as a gift force, does not increase the value of its output, but multiplies its quantity. That is why science is one of the sources through which the productive power of labor grows. Influencing both the instruments of labor and the people serving them, the science introduced into production provided us with a huge saving of living labor. Let's give some examples. With the replacement of the primitive plow with the plow, the horses with tractors, and the sickles and chains with the harvesters, the cost of living labor per ton of grain and man days has decreased considerably. In 1850 they were 117 days, 
In 1913, 71 days and in 1937 on collective farms, 10.2, and on state farms, not more than 7-7 period 5 days. Thus, in less than 100 years, we reduced labor costs per ton of bread by at least 107 days, which is approximately a total annual saving of 14 billion days.